Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 361, featuring the first part of a new interview series with Dr. Cat. Uh, Dr. Cat has a lot of uh, games under his belt. Uh, he's done a lot of work on the Origin, or for Origin, doing the uh, Ultima games. Uh, he's also done a, a project called Furcadia, and much, much more. <laughs> he actually has 35 years uh, history in this industry, and lots of great stories to tell. Now, I was originally going to do my uh, David uh, Dave Wesley series of interviews, but I wanted to do this one first because the uh, he's going to talk about this Legends of Gaming live stream that's coming up December 16th. And I want you guys to know about it now, so you go ahead and plan uh, to watch that, because I think you'll be really interested in it. Anyway, there's a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Dr. Cat. All right, folks, I am here today with Dr. Cat. He's the president and co-founder of Dragon's Eye Productions and creator of a massively multiplayer online social game called Furcadia the world's longest running game of its kind. <laughs> Let that sink in. Uh, his roots go back much further than that, though. He's worked at Origin, Cinematronics, Penguin, and a slew of other companies. He also created one of the first graphical MUDs, a game called Dragon Spires, uh, for DOS-based systems way back in 1994. That's up uh, three years before Ultima Online. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. Uh, where to begin? Uh, how are you today, Dr. Cat? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, I was actually out at Day of the Devs yesterday, had a good time, and I see a paw coming from under my sofa to bat at my feet, which is typical around here. It's uh, my little troublemaker, Somni. Uh, so, yeah, I'm having a nice weekend. Uh, looking forward to uh, trying to finish the first entry for my game design blog today and doing a little housework. Um, and uh, finishing off some Halloween candy. Oh yeah, I know the feeling. I have to put a link to your to your blog in the show notes for people that uh, I want to follow that. Just out of a curiosity, how many cats do you have there, Doctor Cat? Uh, we have three right now. We have three game designers living in the house, and we each kind of have a personal cat that's associated with us. Although, you know, they they uh, all play with us all. Here, Jasmine, come here. Uh, she doesn't want to get on camera yet. We'll coax <laughs> her up later. But yeah, we have a my silver tabby, and my my character in in my online world for Katie is a silver tabby, so he's kind of me. Um, we have uh, uh, Ben's uh, Bengal. He does design on for Katie and for other companies. And our executive producer uh, Emerald, and she has a flame point Siamese who's just adorable. Mm -hmm. So uh, I should I should show you too. I put on my favorite T-shirt. <laughs> interview. Uh, my stepson got me this for Christmas a couple of years ago, and I feel like this is a picture of me. So that is awesome. That, uh, yeah, cats. Cats are a big part of my life, as you might have guessed. <laughs> I had some uh, idea of that. That's that's awesome. Uh, maybe we should start off with some uh, current events, uh, namely the Legends of Gaming live stream that's uh, on the. Books for Friday, December 16th. I'll be sure to post a link to that and try to, try to remember to keep reminding you guys because I know you, you don't want to miss this. Uh, I was looking at some of the folks you've got lined up there to participate. A lot of them have actually been on this show before. Uh, Corey and Lorianne Cole, The Fat Man, Dave Warhol, Noah Falstein, uh, Paul Newrath, and that's just a few. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure this is... I'm going to put this down as must-see TV for anybody watching this show. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this event? Yeah, I should I should mention, by the way, not all of those people have confirmed yet, uh, although nobody said no yet. I have um, several people I'm waiting on who said, I will come if I have that day free, but I have to check my schedule, including uh, Lord British, John Romero. Um, I did get a confirmation from... Um, uh, Bob Clardy, the founder of Synergistic Software, is going to be there yesterday. Part of my excuse for going to, to Day of the Devs to have fun uh, with my local friends and play a bunch of new indie games was, well, I want to stalk Tim Schafer and invite him. And it turned out he remembered me from the 90s at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, and he said, sure, I'll do it if, again, you know, check with my PR guy and let's see if I have time for you that day. So um, it would be great to have him there. 
But yeah, I'm hoping this is going to turn out to be one of the biggest things I've ever done. It's you know a little like what you're doing with interviews, only jam them all together in one day. Uh, I was thinking, well, you know, it's the 20th anniversary of Furcadia, which how often do you get an event like that in your life? And you know, there's there's been like 25th anniversaries of Ultima and stuff, but and there's fans that actively talk about it and still go back and play it, but. Furcadia is a living, breathing, you know, game and community that's very active to this day and hopefully will be for the rest of my life. So I thought, okay, for the 20th anniversary, I could go to a lot of my friends in the industry and say, hey, 20th anniversary, it's a big deal. Can I, you know, can you spare like five to 15 minutes of your time and get on and chat with us? And if I get all these people together, then, you know, hopefully a lot of people just beyond my existing fans are going to want to see, wow, look at all these game developers, the history of gaming all in one day crammed in one place. I'll throw it up on YouTube after we're done live streaming it so people at Mystic can see it. And, you know, it's it's a bit of a thing to promote ourselves and get some new interest. It's something to spoil me a bit, getting to talk to a bunch of people I like. And I'm not going to ask the questions um, that you might ask or, or the gaming press I'll ask some of those. People want to know. But I want each person, my challenge is, can I find something interesting and unique to ask them about that you might not hear from any other source? Like, um, you know, Lord British is going to come on. I'm not going to ask him about Ultima. I know about Ultima. You know, <laughs> the Ultima fans know more about Ultima than I do. They're amazing. I'm going to ask him, hey, when you went up to space, what are like the wacky traditions the Russians have for a new cosmonaut going up the first time? And tell us about the practical jokes you and your family played on each other. You know, um, there's there's some really amazing stories there. But, uh, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I just want to I want to make this thing happen and, and make it epic and, and memorable for everybody. And I think uh, it's just going to be a really fun time. A bunch of game developers hanging around, talking about the old days, maybe a few few new things, too. Um, and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, also a kind of an archival, you know, some important little bits of our history of our industry, which, uh, uh, you know, I, I gave a guest lecture in Brenda Romero's class once, and she said, in our field, unlike, you know, if you're in music, you're not talking to Bach or Beethoven ever, you know, they're long dead, but she said, our Mozarts are still alive, and you can meet and talk to them, and that's why she brings industry guests in to come and, and speak to her game design classes. Uh, she is uh, um, in Ireland now, by the way, and she's teaching at the University of Limerick. And the name is not just a coincidence, it is related to the history of the Limerick. So when I saw her post this on the, the Facebook, uh, I immediately had, because uh, I make Limericks for fun. That's one of one of my many hobbies. Uh, so I wrote three Limericks about her and John and game design and, and posted them to her Facebook. That was... <laughs> You know, things things we do for fun. We, we try and uh, keep lighthearted about our uh, our careers in this business. Now, what's the format of this uh, stream going to be? Is it uh, one at a time, people coming in? Is this everybody all at once? Yeah, one at a time would be kind of the obvious way to do Oh, I should mention, too, I know you're going to put in your notes, com slash legends right. is where you can go. We have a Facebook event that links to. I will be posting new people as they confirm over the next month. Just more and more great names on there. What I'm going to do is set up a Google Hangout. And I already have a co-host, Steve Moretzky, who is the most prolific of the Infocom authors. You know, um, I could mention any of his titles, but of course I have to tease him about Leather Goddesses of Phobos. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's going to be co-hosting from, from remote. I think he's over in like, you know, Asia or the Middle East or Eastern Europe or some godforsaken place on that date. But he's going to Skype in and co-host with me. Um, and then, you know, I want to kind of do like the old Tonight Show did with Johnny Carson. Here's our guest. I'm going to talk to you for, you know, some minutes, and I'm going to schedule slots for people. But then please hang out if you would like to afterwards. And if someone else comes in, um, like, you know, uh, I'm hoping John Romero is going to make it. One of our Fricadia team worked on the first third-party editor for Doom Levels. So I thought, oh, let me get them both on at the same time. They haven't met. They can chat wow. about it. You know, if I can get Carmack, who I don't know personally and haven't contacted yet, you know, how many people would like to see Carmack and, and Romero on at the same time and say hi to each other, you know? <laughs> I think um, universes so, yeah, would explode. Yeah, I'm going to have a group of people on. 
I'm probably going to put up, you know, Fercadia and we'll have a place in Fercadia for people to hang out. I imagine most of our guests aren't going to bother to like get a get an account set up and get on Fercadia, but any of them are welcome to. Some of our staff and our players might be in there, and if they ask questions in there, um, as well as in the Twitch chat, you know, again, we won't get through more than a tiny fraction of what the audience says, but I'd like to grab an audience question or two every now and then and throw that in so the audience gets to participate a bit too. That's one of the great things about all this interactive, inter you know, internet stuff. Um, when I was making games in the 80s, you know, you make a game and then it just kind of goes out there. You go into a computer store, you see it hanging on the wall, and you're kind of very, yeah, I really made stuff. And you get like three letters from people that played the game. And, you know, thousands of other people just play it and don't talk to you. And you have no idea what their reaction is unless you go to like a science fiction convention. But now, you know, we're talking to our players in real time and it's it's great. And it lets us do our job better, too, I feel so. So Friday, December 16th. This is like a Christmas gift. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, the holiday it's, gift. For, the best gift ever uh, for fans of a video game. A history yeah, oh, of war. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I hope this will be an annual. Is this an annual going to be an annual thing, or is it a one-off? See again, I'm I'm always trying to think ahead. <laughs> I mean, we'll get to MMOs later in the view interview. I I came up with the idea for MMORPGs in 1985. I said this is too early. You know, can't do this yet. You know, but but keep it on the back burner. Keep thinking about it. Watch for the right moment. Try and get in too early rather than too late, which I think I did anyway. So, yeah, uh, I have scheduled this as a one-off event, and it might be a one-in-a-lifetime event. But I'm thinking, you know, if a bunch of people say, wow, this is really great, we'd like to see this again next year, whether it's guests or fans or both, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very willing to have my arm twisted into this. This would be a great thing if it became an institution and people wanted it, and a great opportunity for me to keep meeting more people in the industry. Part of what I've done, you know, I made a big spreadsheet. It's like everybody I know that I think would be good. And I made a cutoff. I said, this is the 20th anniversary of Fercadia. You need to have started making games at least 20 years ago. You know, I have a few people that shifted in other careers. Most of them are still making games. But, you know, 20-year veterans. Uh, but all the people I know I want to invite. And then here's some people I'd love to get on that I just haven't met. I haven't met any, everyone in the industry. So I've asked people I know, like Eric Goldberg is very well connected my consulting partner, Dave Rawl, and uh, uh, I'm going to ask Raf Koster to help me track down some of the people I don't know and let me invite them. So if I were doing this every year, you know, give me another five years, I will know everyone in the game industry like uh, like some of my friends already do. So it'd be a great. I maybe put it on a special Blu-ray or something and yeah, let people buy it and fund some, some maybe have fun the future events or something. All right. Two uh, right. questions to uh, to uh, to segue, I guess, a couple of questions here. Uh, one, you said you've been in the industry 20 plus years. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how did you get started in the games industry? That's the first question. The second question, uh, what did cats have to do with it? Yeah, so it's uh, 34 years now and counting. I started as a, a young teenager. Um, and I actually, you know, I went to college at 16, dropped out to make games. Uh, I made my first game in my dorm room at 17. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's let's cover cats, though, real briefly. Uh, I mean, I would have been in with or without cats. I always loved cats. Uh, my parents finally gave in after, you know, telling the kids no pets when we were little. Then they said, OK, we think you're ready for pets now. We got cats. Um, 1980, my buddy Mike, who's at Google now. Uh, when Pokemon Go came out and shattered all their expectations for how many users they get, how fast. And Niantic, you know, went to Google and said, oh, we need more servers, we need more servers. My buddy Mike is the guy they went to to lead the team to say, let's get them all the servers they need online and configured and running as fast as possible. That was Mike. But in, in 1980, Mike told me, um, you should get a modem. Get a modem and get your computer on the university network. There's a message board. People use handles. It's fun. And it was the state university network, you know, with branch campuses around Indiana. So I did. And I'm like, well, what am I going to use for a handle? Uh, I was a Doctor Who fan uh, from public television, a Chicago station we could pick up in South Bend, Indiana on cable. 
And uh, there was this guy at a really tiny little science fiction fantasy convention. Mark Rogers had shown up with his samurai cat art prints. And I saw them and immediately fell in love. I'm like, well, I have enough allowance money to get like three of these six or seven prints he's got. And so I used the handles Doctor Who and Samurai Cat as my first two online handles. And I shoved them together to make Doctor Cat. When I started making games, which I knew when my dad got me a computer at 14, I was going to make games with it. I immediately, I actually wrote my first game. Dad said he was getting it, but he needed to, to get the money together because they just bought a new car. He had to wait for the next paycheck. So I used my mom's Sears electric typewriter. I got a book out of the Notre Dame library with my dad's card on how to program. And I wrote John Horton Conway's Game of Life on an electric typewriter. So as soon as the computer arrived, I'd be able to type it in and, and play with it right away. So, yeah, that was that was my first game, which never worked. Um, I really need to go back. I did a, a an Apple II multicolor version, which partly worked, but I never debugged it. And then a, a Google job interview, they asked me to write life on a whiteboard. And I took a photo of it afterwards. I like, I think I didn't make any mistakes this time. Uh, you know, still <laughs> put it in. But uh, um yeah, so when I was in college, uh, there was actually a, an Associated Press newspaper article went out nationwide about me because I was a 17-year-old college sophomore with two personal computers in his dorm room. And this was back when most people didn't have one. This was for like hardcore early adopters of technology. I had two computers in my room. And I said I was going to make games for a living and, you know, may go out to California, which took me till 2010. I finally got here. Um, after making games everywhere else in the country. But uh, uh, yeah, I made made my first game in my dorm room and I sent it to Broderbund. And uh, one of the brothers that founded the company sent some very nice notes back. He said, this is good. We'd like to see you make some of these improvements and, and submit it to us again, or you have a good chance getting it published somewhere else if you don't. And I'm like, oh, I just wanted to whip the game out quick and get some money coming in and then make a better game. So I sent it to a shoddier publisher and they published it. Oh. And uh, yeah, uh, looking back, it would have been nice to uh, to get out through Broderbund instead, but I didn't know how to make the improvements they wanted. I had memory was full already and they wanted, I had all this animation and it would have been tough. Might well have been worth it, but, you know, uh, the path I took worked out, so. Who was, no your favorite? Who was the, the doctor at that time? I'm just kind of curious. Was it Tom Baker by any chance? Oh, absolutely. Oh. Tom Baker was the best doctor, although I love uh, David Tennant is great. Um, and uh, not everybody knows this. A lot of the episodes at the time were written by Douglas Adams, uh, of Hitchhiker's Guide fame, who is a great writer and a great comedy writer in particular. Um, you know, my co-host Steve Moretzky got to do the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, um, Infocom adventure to kind of tie all that together. And there was actually one episode of Tom Baker that had a cameo by John Cleese, who is absolutely one of my favorite comic actors ever. He's got a, a new book out I have to get. I was just hearing. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I love Tom Baker. I was very, uh, uh, very inspired by him. He found his way into one of my friend's D&D games. My, my character and hers ended up going off in the TARDIS at the end of the uh, end of the whole campaign. And that was that was our happy ending. <laughs> uh, we could definitely talk about Doctor Who for a while. I'm a big fan. I've got a little Tom Baker display over there. But <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, so great stuff. Great yeah, stuff. I love it. Uh, the ca the caverns of uh, is it Freitag or Freitag? Freitag is how I Freitag. pronounce it. Freitag. The caverns of Freitag. German, it's a German word. I hope I'm saying it right with my horrible American accent. <laughs> um, it's the German word for Friday. But uh, okay, well, let's a... let's talk about this game. Uh, let's talk about it a little bit. It's published. Grab a cat. Grab a cat. Yeah, he's <laughs> being <laughs> being reticent here. This is my Somni. Uh, his full name is Dua Somni, which is words in two different languages for second and for dream. So he's kind of named to go with our, our Fricadia second dreaming. But uh, we were talking about Caverns of Freitag. So let's. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first game. That close up. <laughs> OK. You can go. Uh, so the first game you're credited with on Moby Games. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hopefully this is accurate is the Caverns of uh, Fre Freitag. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Caverns of Freitag. 
uh, published by uh, Muse for the Apple II in 1982. Yeah, that's I, right. I was taking a look at the screenshots on that. A lot of personality, a lot of humor, uh, but look, quite a bit of ambition, too, I would say. It's, it's described there as an action-based RPG with three different display modes. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this game and the impact that it had. Uh, well, I wouldn't say it had a lot of impact. I think it sold about uh, 3,000, 3,500 copies, which was not bad for back then. But, you know, a hit was like 30,000 copies, which certainly would have made me more money. Uh, and there were companies paying better royalty rates than Muse. Uh, but, uh, you know, it got me started. It got me money to, like, move out of my dorm room and, and get an apartment and start making games full time. That plus the graphics package I did. The first thing I did, I said, okay, the Apple II doesn't have any graphics routines. There were Apple-shaped tables and uh, a line drawing command, but I thought they were kind of shoddy and not good enough quality for a professional game, so I wasn't even going to consider using them. So I wrote an assembly language, 6502 assembly language graphics package, which took up 6K of memory. Uh, I ended up sending that to Byte Magazine. I put it in public domain, and... Uh, a senior technical editor who became a friend of mine and he went on to move to Apple later. He was a fellow board game collector, Greg Williams, um, sent me a nice letter and said, you're welcome to call me on the phone, which I did. He said, you know, I love your article. It's very generous of you to give away all this great, high quality, useful software for free. But the source code listing you sent us would take up, you know, like 40, 50 pages in the magazine, and that's we can't afford that amount of space for, for an article on this. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. So he said, let's, let's you know, publish uh, uh, like a couple paragraphs in the Bytes Bits column telling people this package is available. Here's how you can get a copy from the author. And I ended up making as much money giving that away for free as I did for my royalties on Caverns of Bright Dog. Because he said, ask people for 5 to $10 plus a blank disc plus a SAZI. Um, so it's not costing you anything and you make a little money. Okay. And I got hundreds of people. Byte was the biggest computer magazine at the time. Hmm. Um, and he called back to like verify the address and other facts before publication. And he said, I think you should add, uh, oh, he said 5 to $10, right? So I said $5 because I'm an idealistic young college student, right? <laughs> Um, and I said, oh, make sure you mention, check your local user group first and contact me if you can't find it. He didn't want it. I'm like, you know, being, being <laughs> idealist, um, which I, I still stuck with some of that today. But, uh, he called back to fact check. He said, I think you should ask for $8. I'm like, okay, $8, whatever I gave in, you know, and I got 500 people, you know, wrote in. So 4,000 bucks from giving away software for free, which, which wasn't bad. Um, but yeah, I wrote the graphics package when I was all done with the game. I wrote a paint program cause I said, well, Apple two games have a title screen that comes up when you start loading them. And so I should have a title screen. And I went and someone at the university had a, a copy of complete graphic system from penguin, which I would end up becoming involved in later. I said, this paint program, you know, you can draw fine if you have the $850 Apple two graphics tablet which I did not have. It was expensive as hell, right? But the joystick control is not good enough to draw with, and there's no keyboard control. You know, you have to have a graphics tablet. So I wrote my own paint program, which didn't support the graphics tablet because I didn't have one, but it worked well with the joystick. It had relative or absolute positioning control with the joystick with seven user-selectable levels of sensitivity, or you could go keyboard control to move pixel by pixel, or up to, um, you know, you could go in five pixel jumps with the control key. They had, you know, 143 color patterns, so I had 192. You know, they had uh, 100 paint brushes, so I had 256. I, like, out everything in the complete graphic system had a magnified mode. I had three levels of magnification to choose between. Um, so it was a great paint program. I ended up giving that one away for free, but it wasn't announced in Byte Magazine. So I got $15 giving that away for free, 10 of which was from Greg Williams, the editor at Byte. I met. But uh, yeah, um, the game I wrote in basic, calling my assembly language routines, it filled up all the memory. I used my shape editor to draw the art. Um, I drew most of it pixel by pixel. You know, uh, Griffins, and uh, which I uh, nicknamed the Winged Nosebiter. Um, and I had like six shapes pieced together to make a big dragon at the end of it. 
and um, I put my big stuffed dragon on top of my monitor and like looked at it while I was drawing the dragon as a reference. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I have a little in and your, <clears throat> your character with a sword and your character with a bow and, and some various other monsters I put in. And then to make the maze, I just took my shape editor. I said, well, let me draw an 80 by 80 pixel shape, but I'm not going to use it as graphics. I'm going to like grab that data and make it into a maze where each pixel is one block. So I just put, you know, a white pixel was a wall and an empty pixel was floor. And then I manually put in the inn and the dragon. And, you know, there's a color change. The walls change from purple to red when you get to the dragon zone with his special little mini maze. And if you look in the, you know, overview map mode, which was done on the Apple text screen, um, you could see there was a place in the in the maze where I wrote Dr. Cat in uh, uh with walls as pixels, you know, you could see my name hidden in the maze and yeah, it was, it was fun. You know, it wasn't a really deep game, but it was fun to play. You can still play it by the way. There's web-based Apple II emulators with big libraries of old Apple software and you can play Caverns of Freitag on a web page. Um, if you, if you can dig that address up or I can get it to you, you can put that in your links too. Uh, not that I recommend people waste their time, that way, you know, <laughs> I think your games are well, a lot it's probably better. better than a lot of the games yeah. out there now. Well, only because there's such a range of quality out there. There's uh, there's thousands of games better than it that you could get for free on your uh, your web browser or your smartphone uh, at the, the drop of a hat. It was funny to me to go to Day of the Devs. You know, I wanted to hang out with my friend Rachel. I wanted to see Tim Schafer. Uh, but here's people actually standing in line to play games even though you can you can play probably tens of thousands of games for free at any moment of your life, whether you're at your computer or just out somewhere with your smartphone. But these are new games. You could be first. So they'd stand in line. I played some games that didn't have a line. You know, I managed to, managed to catch a few. But uh, uh, my friend Rachel's like waiting and getting impatient for some of the more popular games. I, I, don't, I don't like to do lines. Life's too short. And that's all for this week's episode. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully we'll be back next week. We are entering the last couple of weeks here. It's uh, St. Cloud State, though, and uh, there's lots of grading that has to be done in a very short period of time. So I'm going to try my best to get an episode out. I'm sure you noticed there wasn't an episode last week for that same reason, so it's been a pretty tough time. But I'm going to try my best to keep the uh, episodes coming out on a regular basis. Uh, I want to get at least to uh, the second part of this interview series before I take off for the holidays. Uh, as always, though, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very, very, very much for your support of this show. Really, really awesome. I really appreciate you guys uh, stepping up to the plate. Uh, remember, if you want to help out, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, it's very easy to uh, become a patron or a ratron, as I like to say. And I think you'll like the show a lot more if you do that. And it it's, uh, gives you that warm and fuzzy feeling every time you see the new Matt Chat episode uh, in your subscription box. So I uh, thank you very much for your support of the show. Oh, uh, let's see uh, what else. Oh, well, yes. Uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> All right, so old Stig wrote in. Uh, I think he's a, probably the official Matt Chat reporter at this point. But uh, anyway, he wrote in about this game called Tavern Keeper. Uh, this is a fantasy tavern simulator. It's developed by Greenheart Games. You manage a tavern, build, barter, cook, and clean your way. Uh, cooking and cleaning. Now, there's a great game concept. Uh, to success in a humorous fantasy world, start out with a shell of a tavern. Uh, you build uh, item, you build rooms, place items, stock the larder, hire staff. Uh, then you get larger taverns, more drinking, uh, new meals. It sounds uh, pretty good. You know, I actually was uh, thinking, I thought he was talking about another game when he wrote in, uh, Epic Tavern. Uh, there's also one called Moonstone Tavern. It seems like there's this whole little genre of uh, tavern games. It's kind of interesting. I'm guessing it's just about uh, some guys sitting down at a bar and coming up with uh, ideas for games. <laughs> Uh, anyway, these all look pretty good to me. I'd like to know your thoughts on them. 
Uh, also, I've been playing a new game. This just came out December 1st. It's called The Dwarves. I always love dwarves. Uh, they're one of my favorite fantasy uh, races. Uh, this game, you explore a vast world of like tactical real-time battles, uh, experience a fantastic story, and apparently this is based on, uh, I guess, a novel called The Dwarves. I haven't read that, uh, but uh, the writing in the game is really good, so it makes me think this uh, book, if that's what it is, is pretty good too. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a Betrayal of Crondor with a little bit of uh, Warcraft. Uh, not so much the world of Warcraft as the old Warcraft uh, real-time strategy game. Uh, one of my favorites. Uh, anyway, lots of fun. Go check this game out. Uh, if you want to, oh, and I want to say the music is really good too. It's uh, actually got really good music. It's one of the few modern RPG games I've played that actually has music that really stands out. So I uh, really like that. Now, if you want to buy this one, uh, go to don't don't go to Steam. Go to GOG. Uh, there'll be a link in the show notes there. It's about thirty six bucks. Uh, but if you buy it from GOG, a little kickback will come my way. Won't cost you anything extra. So. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, there's a new action RPG in development. This is called Dauntless. Uh, this is uh, from the website Verge. Uh, they said that this uh, Dauntless game is the first one from Phoenix Labs. This is a studio with uh, Blizzard and Bioware veterans. That's kind of interesting. And also a League of Legends uh, senior designer. Uh, they say they've taken inspiration from Dark Souls, Monster Hunter, and uh, World of Warcraft. And it's going to be something like Torchlight with Dinosaurs. I saw that uh, described that way. So that one looks pretty interesting, too. Uh, I don't think they have a date on that one yet, but definitely something to keep an eye on. That's dauntless. All right. Uh, last bit of news. Uh, of course, it's still not too late. If you would like to pick up a couple of books for Christmas, uh, Vintage Games Consoles and Vintage Games 2.0. Uh, I have them here. Uh, I hear from the... <laughs> this author's pretty good. Uh, I guess uh, you can... Uh, see for yourself for these books. But uh, anyway, I think both of these would be a really good uh, item for somebody stocking. Of course, uh, this, this is the uh, latest one, Vintage Games 2.0. Uh, I think you'll really like both of these. If you like the stuff on the show, I'm sure you'll like these books too. Really good stories about uh, video game history, and it's very readable and lots of pictures. And <laughs> you know, what more can I say? I think you'll like these. Uh, go check them out on uh, Amazon if you haven't already. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, let's see. Well, I was looking for some sort of Christmassy themed dells. Uh, I thought there'd be more. I, I had to kind of look hard to find this one and probably need to go check out some other stores. But uh, this one is at least uh, winter themed. This is the Fireside Chat Winter Spiced Ale. So I like the word chat in the title. That's pretty cool. Now, uh, let's see. 7.9% alcohol. Uh, so it's, it's not, that's pretty high. Not, not too crazy. Well, actually, <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty high. Uh, 45 IBUs. I still don't know how my IBUs calibrated very well, so I'm not sure how bitter that that's going to be. Uh, let's see. 21st Amendment Brewery. It's got a old. Uh, uh, who was the chat guy? That was uh, Roosevelt, right? Is that right? <laughs> I hope so. Uh, let's see what else. Um, eh, I thought usually they tell you where it was brewed. Oh, there we go. Uh, San Leandro, California. So it's brewed and canned there. It's a seasonal release. Anyway, I love the very classy uh, artwork on the can here. I love that. Uh, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Fireside Chat Winter Spiced Ale here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've uh, been smelling it. I'm a little bit congested today, so it's a little harder to uh, smell than usual, but I definitely smell some kind of... Uh, uh, Christmassy themed spice in this, kind of a nutmeg. It's kind of what it smells like uh, more than anything to me. But like I say, my <laughs> I'm a little congested, so take that with a grain of salt. Uh, anyway, let's give it a taste. Uh, it's definitely a bit on the uh, bitter side. Uh, that 45 IBU is, I guess you yeah, uh, you definitely taste some bitterness here. Uh, it's a little sweet too. Uh, you can tell this has got some uh, pretty high alcohol content in it, uh, which is not bad. You know, I've always said that if, uh, if a beer has a lot of alcohol in it, I kind of want to know that. Uh, I want to taste it so I can kind of pace myself better that way. Uh, so that's not a problem for me. Um, taste-wise, I'm getting some cherry, some bourbon flavors in here. 
Uh, not, I mean, if, uh, I don't know what kind of spices they've added here, but they definitely haven't overwhelmed it. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have some kind of funky wang to it or anything with weird spices. It actually tastes quite nice. I'll try it again here. Yeah, with this one, you know, it's not something I would probably want to have a six pack of. Uh, you, get, you do taste a lot of bitterness, a little bit of a sweet cherry kind of flavor, a little bit of a bourbon flavor. Uh, but it's definitely on the on the strong side and i guess it is you know it, it kind of fits the theme of fireside chat you know you pour this and sip on it slowly uh, that would be pretty fun i guess but uh, uh definitely not something you'd want to chug but anyway it's not bad uh not my favorite but certainly not my uh, least favorite uh, so i think i'm gonna go three very close to a four out of five uh, drinking horns on this one uh, fireside chat it's uh, definitely interesting if you like a stronger taste and some uh, something on the bitter side I think this one would uh, really fit the bill. Uh, so I'll go, uh, I'll go ahead and go four out of five, I guess, on the Fireside Chat uh, Winter Spice Day. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotes about cats. <laughs> and I found this one from, uh, of all people, H.P. Lovecraft. And I've, I've read this a couple times. I'm still not quite sure. I get, I get it, but uh, I'll go ahead and read it to you, and you can uh, see what you think. Anyway, it goes something like this. The real lover of cats is one who demands a clearer adjustment to the universe than ordinary household platitudes provide. One who refuses to swallow the sentimental notion that all good people love dogs, children, and horses, while all bad people dislike and are disliked by such. <laughs> anyway, mull that over and see you guys next week. Did IQs just drop sharply while I was away? <laughs>